Доброе утро. Благодарю, что пришли к нам на молодежный форум. Good morning. Thank you for coming here to the youth forum. Today we will be talking about the digital transformation, the future technology, and how will we understand what is relevant and what is not, uh, what uh, is in the hype realm and is not going to be uh, materialized. And today we have wonderful participants joining us. Andrei Yerantsev, the vice president of uh, Wargaming Company. Alexander Panchenko, deputy CEO of Summa. And uh, Anatoly Alexandrov, Rector of the Bauman uh, State Technical University. And just uh, a few words about our plan. You probably know uh, that uh, this is a concept pioneered by Gartner called hype uh, cycle of technologies, i.e. It talks about how technological trends are evolving. At some stage of technology development, uh, they start talking about those technologies uh, more than they actually implement those technologies. And we can see that uh, everywhere. Blockchain is one example. Everyone talks about it. And we don't see a lot of uh, real implementation of it. And uh, at some point, uh, you get disillusioned. However, the technology continues to evolve, and then it uh, continues to build capacity, and uh, it gets implemented finally. So personally, and I, I forgot to introduce myself. Um, my last name is Kazaren. I'm the uh, key chief analyst of electronic communications uh, company. As an analyst, I'm interested in two uh, ends of this curve, what is beginning to emerge, and what is going to be of interest to you, something that you would be learning from, and something that you would be promoting. And then the second end is uh, something that is not discussed widely, but is uh, nevertheless uh, taking place uh, on a broad scale, something that gets implemented. Uh, I would like to say, speaking about our distinguished guests. Uh, we don't know which of the technologies that are emerging will get uh, implemented and how they will get implemented. About 20 years ago, a uh, good acquaintance of mine uh, worked at MIT working on electroconductivity of the skin cells, human skin cells. And 10 years uh, later, they built the uh, capacitance uh, screens uh, that you can find in any uh, smartphone. So that technology overgrew the technology. You see gaming video boards, they started, they created the basis for blockchain and for AI in many respects. Uh, because this is one of the key uh, component of these systems. And I can give you a lot of examples of that. And I would like to give the floor now to Anatoly Alexandrov. And uh, I would like to talk to him about how technological trends uh, intersect, overlap, and how can one properly get education in this new world. That's a very well put question, and uh, only Lazy people don't talk about digital technologies today. Even if they don't understand uh, these technologies or likes them. But uh, anything we do, we use a lot of things. My mother-in-law is 77 years of age. And uh, anything that comes down to ordering food, water, paying bills, utilities, she does all of that using her tablet. And when grandchildren uh, start arguing about digital technologies, she would say, well, you're arguing about uh, really immaterial things because there are no digital technologies without understanding that those digital technologies are around her, surrounding her. The world is changing at uh, uh, 
at a pace that we don't appreciate sometimes. We start understanding what is ha happening after the innovations have entered the world. And if we uh, remember, when we uh, walk through the uh, checkpoint, you, you would see the Buran uh, space shuttle built by the Russians. And of course, we are still arguing which uh, space shuttle uh, concept is better, ours or the Americans, but they are more or less the same. But that was a mega project that is uh, at the edge of uh, reality. And the Soviet uh, Buran project was unique in that it was the only project that didn't have any hiccups along the way. It was uh, the one that had two launches. Both of them were successful. That was the first example of this. But this Buran was created without a single piece of paper. Nobody was talking about digital technologies back then, but that was oh, nearly 50 years ago. So that's, um, that's the answer. There you go. And today's uh, digital trends are everywhere. We just uh, fail to understand that uh, our um, university uh, is known to be hard to get into. Uh, a lot of smart people try to enroll, and uh, not all of them succeed. And I see a lot of bright people like that sitting in this room. And people really want to enroll in those degree programs that uh, have the word digital in them without understanding that we don't have any other. So if you are designing a tractor, you would still have to use digital technologies. Uh, there was a uh, joke about someone uh, who was cursing, and somebody was saying, well, shame on you. You're cursing. And he said, no, 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 I'm not cursing. That's the language I use all the time. So nobody is uh, using the outdated technologies. You cannot build things with outdated technologies. The digital technology has to be there, but it has to be uh, built into everything that we have around us. It has to permeate everything we do. And the key value of that is that we don't understand uh, that it's, and we don't appreciate it, it's around us. Whenever we turn the light on, uh, we do not think about the river flowing somewhere. There was a big dam that uh, was uh, built in order to build a hydropower station, a hydropower plant. We just switch the toggle on. And uh, maybe later today I will speak about it uh, more. At the Bauman State University, we are not responsible for digital technologies. That's not our focus. We are responsible for a lot of things, including intellectual and smart systems, uh, robotics, new materials, uh, plasma, photonics, and anything that has to do with infrared technology. Uh, and a lot of other things, uh, the things that don't sound uh, romantic, uh, steel rolling uh, and uh, steel casting, and a lot of other things like that that doesn't sound really romantic. And so our goal is to unite these trends uh, because we cannot create a tractor today by just pushing a button, but we understand clearly that if we try to start from a different plane, we're going to be getting much stronger. A lot has been said about uh, the various uh, technological uh, steps or phases of evolution. Nobody knows uh, what uh, is uh, happening. We understand that nanotechnologies are the buzz of the, world, the, buzz of the day. And uh, we are trying to create bionic technologies, nature-like technologies. It's important not to sleep this over, uh, to notice what is happening at the uh, juncture of uh, the junction of the various uh, sciences. And so it's important to have the merger there. Uh, let me ask you another question, a very applied question. Very often they say Russia needs more uh, coders, programmers, even more and more, although we have enough. However, I understand that almost every engineer needs a certain set of skills. What kind of skills do they need? Where is that uh, standard uh, that separates the, you know, the fundamental and the applied uh, level of expertise? Well, I don't know if you're addressing this to the right person, but I would like to say that uh, if uh, we go back to 1813, we have been uh, um, the organization that focused on fundamental studies, uh, 
So we started uh, graduating scientists. Then we realized that we needed engineers. And then the uh, professor from the Moscow State University, the only university in Moscow, came to us, and they raised the bar. So we are building our educational system on the fundamental knowledge. However, we are very much applied uh, university. Our other universities, like physical and uh, physics and technology university, they are the people that know everything about life, or MIFI, they know everything about the nuclear reactors. And we are the only ones who can actually design and build a nuclear reactor. That's where the uh, borderline is. And why do we study the world around us? So that we could use the results of our studies. That's the goal. That's our motto, and we have to go by it. As for the programmers, I'd like to note here that the word Russian is not always used when we talk about programmer or programming. The Russians did this. The Russians invented this. But most of the best programmers in the world, they speak Russian. They are the people that got their education here. And what's very important to note, there are a lot of talented programmers uh, per capita uh, in Russia, probably more than anywhere else in the world. And uh, the important thing to note is that there are people that get born in a certain area. People uh, live in, in the Alps and the Yodel, and nobody else does this. And to use that example, our people have our own talents. And uh, our land will bear more of them. We uh, are not uh, probably the best at using what our land offers us. but. Uh, we just need a lot of talented people, and whether they're going to be fundamentalists in terms of science or whether they're going to be applied scientists, that's something that uh, the future will determine. And Andre, I, I would like to talk to you now. Wargaming is a very unique company. I don't know of any other example where there would be such a popular company worldwide. And I would uh, also like to note that uh, uh, this is the company that uh, sets an example for all the youngsters in the country. And uh, despite the fact that this is a gaming company, I'd like to say that this is indeed a uh, company that develops uh, uh, games. And the, the, they are the people that uh, the uh, creme de la creme, uh, cream of the cream, uh, they're creating the most difficult and challenging things, close to programming, of course. but. Uh, how um, are you feeling in that role? Let us find out. Has anyone heard about uh, uh, the world of tanks? Will you please raise your hands? Wonderful. Somebody is probably uh, getting. Is there someone from uh, the Moscow State University? So, m mostly the Bauman State University. Uh, that's my alma mater. Speaking about war gaming and computer games, you're absolutely right when you say that this is indeed a very uh, difficult and complex software. Very few people think about it, but this is really very intensive, uh, high-tech uh, applications. And those loads that uh, the World of Tank uh, has, they are exceeding the uh, loads on the largest Russian telecoms and the banking systems and processing systems. In the winter of 2014, we had uh, over one million concurrent players. And these users need to have an opportunity to get the information uh, live uh, about what's happening on the battlefield of the game. Speaking about today's subject, we wanted to talk about trends. And for wargaming, and not just for Wargaming, but any other company that is in the uh, game business, it's important to separate the uh, uh, short-lived trends, the, something that is a fad, and the uh, long-lived uh, trends. And of course, we focus on the long-lived trends. Because if we try to catch up with uh, everything that is uh, a fad today and vogue today, it will just fade away. In, uh, years' time, and uh, you will uh, just waste a lot of time. So when we 
discuss our company's strategy at the strategic summits we participate in, we think about long-term trends. And these trends are based on uh, how humans consume information, how they evolve, uh, and uh, they focus on what people are going to be doing in the future. There are a number of trends I would like to highlight, uh, something that I find very interesting, something that I observe. In February of this year, the Berkeley uh, Institute in the United States published their report. Uh, they had analyzed uh, unemployment rates over the last 15 years. What they found out was that the uh, uh, the level of uh, the number of younger people from 21 to 31, that's their age. In that group, the number of uh, work hours per week has declined in that group, and therefore the, their employment has declined as well. They uh, start working later. Uh, uh, they stay with their parents for longer. And so that was correlated with computer games. They show a link to computer games. And the number of working hours has uh, reduced, but their satisfaction with life has increased. They are happier with uh, how they live. Indeed, the reason here may be uh, the computer games. And they had also uh, did a reverse study. What happens with the brain of an individual who plays games? It turned out that when you play a game, when you develop your character, when you uh, enhance your skills, like using your mouse when you shoot, it's similar to uh, feeling that you've just done your job really well. Uh, it can be compared with someone who just uh, completed a report for the company he works for, and he's very happy. Uh, it's like getting to level 80 in, in your gaming world. So from the brain standpoint, uh, game is, very, is not very different from, from work. And right now, uh, there is a trend towards ro robotization. And uh, some philosophers and scientists, they forecast that uh, in the near future, many of the uh, many of workplaces will be automated. And uh, in Europe, they start uh, driving those uh, uh, pilot free trucks, uh, unmanned trucks. Uh, so what will humans do when they go back to work? They will probably be getting some subsistence allowance. And what are they going to be doing? I mean, with their free time, most likely they will be uh, playing games. Uh, Iwali Harari is a contemporary philosopher, said that industrialization in the 19th century begot the uh, new uh, working class. And uh, this uh, automation will breed the new class of uh, the unemployed. It means that I will have a lot of uh, work to go uh, with. Well, you're really egotistical here. And uh, the company Wargaming that I represent, the one that makes the games that are very much in demand among the adult population, uh, including your uh, parents. That's great. That means that there will be more games in the next five to ten years, uh, more players in the next five to ten years. So these guys will go to work and their dads will just sit at the uh, computer table. Computer games are important. We all know that 2,000 years ago, since the Roman Empire, when they spoke about bread and entertainment, well, since then, things have changed. Um, some, though, who remained stable, but and, and, uh, bread and entertainment continued to be as important. At that uh, point in time, it was gladiator games. Early 20th century, it was uh, movies. Now it's games. More than 2 billion people on planet Earth are gaming. And uh, the gaming industry is hun worth a hundred billion dollars and growing very quickly, 15 to 10 to 15 percent every year. This is kind of philosophical background that we're using to tr um, uh, monitor those trends. For war 
gaming, the strategy of the company is very simple. We are producing content and we're distributing content. Well, our niche is more uh, older people, adult people, and very in line with the trend in the evolution of modern technologies. And we see that happening. We see people coming to us uh, and staying with us. Andre, I have this question. Maybe a practical one. I know that Wargaming is qu quite uh, active in VR projects. For you, is it only today or uh, something for the future? Is it going to be common in the future? Well, there are very many practical trends in terms of gaming. Oh, let's speak about this. Uh, speaking uh, uh, speak, uh, specifically about VR and ER. Well, we in Wargaming investing in two areas. First, what you can see already, VR. If you haven't seen that, uh, well, you can uh, uh, have Tank T-34. And since Wargaming from the very start, we thought that, well, we are earning money, of course, but we like dealing with museums, museums of world, of world technologies, and we're helping those museums. But sometimes you cannot find a model of an older tank. So we're making virtual reality models of tanks or uh, warships that are no longer there. And we will add this content to um, museums. We're inv investing their virtual reality for museums. And, well, maybe for an event like this, we can produce a virtual reality tank uh, for the sake of such an event. Uh, together with um, VR Tech, a Russian company, we are also uh, developing a stunt of sorts. We will have a, a project which is called Caliber. It's uh, special forces are in the focus of that project, and we'll have a stand where four persons can accomplish a mission of special forces. Uh, 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 last time we tried it in Tokyo Game Show or three weeks ago. It works great. Um, no, the visitors like it very much. And this area of VR tech is like arcade so far, not a mess uh, commercial state. Uh, narrow, rather, arcade places. And for this in Moscow, we'll have one in a major uh, shopping mall, a place where people could come and play. Uh, we will check on what the demand is, whether there's going to be any um, commercial interest in that. We will see whether to scale it up or not. So virtual reality and DR, it's not mass technology. So when we are unemployed, we know where to go shopping malls and play the games, right? Yes, but it's deep immersion. It's very, very impressive. Uh, you need to also provide pills because people get uh, so addicted to such games. They need to calm down. Neuro interfaces are something like this to enhance reality. Alexander Panchenka. Your group of companies, Summa, is one of the more advanced companies on planet Earth in the development of transportation technologies. You might have heard about them. Well, Virgin, uh, Richard Branson, invested uh, into the Hyperloop One project to build high-speed Trains. You can call it trains, but you can call it otherwise as well. My question to you, Alexander. Well, this breakthrough project, uh, where did you summon the courage to take up that project? Well, there are some people who are still non-believers in the project. Okay, this is morning uh, on a Monday. 
And there are so many people present here. First of all, thank you for coming to this audience and listening to the technologies of the future. And my thanks to the organizers, with very m many young people um, represented in the organizing committee as well, for the opportunity to speak here before uh, so many people, and for the opportunity for dozens of young people coming to Sochi, very nice, beautiful, and hospitable city. Uh, the snow is already in the mountains. We are. Um, waiting for uh, the alpine skiing um, season to start because we are fans. Now, a few words about my company. Uh, uh, the Summa Group, uh, transport logistics, uh, uh, agriculture, we have sporting projects, we has, have promotion, organizing MMA uh, fights. We have our ice hockey team uh, called Admiral in Vladivostok. So we're quite a heavy asset company. Our main assets are in the traditional areas, though. We manage ports, uh, on cargo ships, uh, rail stock, gas producing um, telco assets, and many other things. Oh, I'm looking at these traditional areas like transport and logistics. And while uh, thinking into the future, five to seven years again, again ahead, I, we don't expect technologies to change very much, like container shipments from Shanghai to Moscow. It's going to be the same uh, type of logistics, uh, moved by sea to Shanghai, then um, reloaded onto a train going to Vlad Vladivostok, and then it goes along the railway up to Novosibirsk, Yekaterinburg, or, or Moscow, or any other city. So in those traditional areas, we haven't gotten uh, new business models. Unlike the cab service, with Uber coming, the whole business has changed. We don't see such things happening, happening in our traditional business, but that could happen. And there's a certain sense of unpredictability in, in that respect. What can happen to our, our traditional businesses? The range of opportunities is quite uh, broad. And uh, those opportunities may bring additional profits to the business or create problems for them. Uh, uh, recently, because of that, Mr. Magalmedov, the head of the FUD, created a Caspian fund to invest in the more promising technologies throughout the world. And what is very important here, the purpose of this fund is to create conditions for the development of those technologies and implementation of such technologies in Russia and the CIS countries. Now, briefly, about two trends we believe in. First is new types of transportation. We're using cars, uh, boats, uh, planes. It is time to see something new. And we see two trends there. One, Karen already spoke about Hyperloop uh, technology and drones. Hyperloop is a pipeline, large diameter, more than three meters. Uh, at the speed of more than a thousand uh, kilometers per hour, there would be a capsule traveling, you know, the pot. There's a testing going on in Nevada, a full-sized model. Uh, soon it will be tested, completed for the transportation of cargo first and later for passengers. We believe that this high-speed transport would revolutionize the whole transportation industry and manufacturing industry as well. If you're a manufacturer in Germany, so to speak, uh, you order some parts from China. If it's shipped by sea, it's 30 to 40 days. Hyperloop technology will allow traveling uh, those uh, cargoes in 15, 17 hours, which would dramatically change the manufacturing landscape. There is not going to be centralized production any longer. This high-speed technology 
would enable um, create distributed uh, manufacturing facilities connected by hyperloops. It's very quick pace at which the technology is evolving. You can see videos of how a pod is placed into the pipeline, uh, how it is being tested. And we believe in this as a very, very promising um, revolutionary technology. The second uh, trend, drones. Well, you probably all saw quadrocopters or um, controlled them. And uh, you know it's very easy, simple. And Russia, the world, uh, new drones are being developed in particular for passenger transport. It's also a trend that's worth um, monitoring because national economies and the states should be interested in the development of such ways of transportation because drones do not require um, expensive infrastructure like uh, bridges, tunnels, etc. And the second trend is artificial intelligence. So a lot being spoken about our AI right now, but in actual fact, every day something's happening in this area. Very impressive things happening, and the Russian companies are are uh, involved with the voice services and other things, and many things happening in other countries. Artificial intelligence evidently will reduce in global spending because people would more and more. Uh, rely for machines on their routine uh, tasks and will have more and more spare time. Of course, computer games is a good alternative, but would be great if people use the spare time to do some creativity, some creative wor work. This is, of course, a philosophical question, but it's very important to use this time correctly for creative artistic initiative. And I'm sure there's going to be a surge of creative endeavor with the advance of automation and well, new technologies. Information navigators, mass media, new media will help on that, you know, finding people their bearings in the new reality. And we have to get prepared. The labor market is going to change very seriously. So, and the economy using the technology would move to individual consumption model. When we order a uh, cab, we are ordering a tailor-made product. We want uh, somebody to pick us up at one, in one point and deliver us to another point. The next step would be uh, the transition uh, of heavy industries like uh, transport, logistics, or construction to this uh, individual approach where we will be able to design and build our own houses. Where it's going to start probably is retail, like an Alibaba group. While they are the father, we go the more uh, they they are replacing retail. This is direct uh, contact between manufacturer and consumer, and they don't have warehouse. Uh, no, they do have uh, warehouses, but with a lot of ro robots and drones, no people uh, uh, looks phenomenal and even threatening to an extent. Actually, transport, agriculture, I see these new models, well, the more data we accumulate, the more possibilities for the creation of these new models, like logistics of containers. What we uh, have uh, in terms of new t uh, technologies uh, evolving in this area is tracking systems for the containers, where you know at any point in time where the container is, what kind of goods inside the container. This is something new, well, difficult to achieve using um, traditional technologies. That's why Maersk investing in blockchain 
chain technology because that's going to um, help their business a lot. In agriculture, several years ago, I was surprised to see the following. I saw, well, there was a disbalance where, on the one hand, people know and use drones to inspect their fields where just in place agriculture where you know where each particular um, plant is located, where uh, satellites and sensors are being used, when all uh, cows have an inbuilt chip. But at the same time, uh, a big farmer uh, complained to me that they don't have internet access. So th these are great technologies, but you cannot use them without internet. So there's a bit of a disbalance. And the same in transport and logistic. logistics. Well, uh, you can track your containers, but you don't have good roads. And I do think that these things are going to be more pronounced in the future, especially in developing countries. Africa, great mobile services there, but no electricity. For Russia, Anatoly, uh, can you have you identified any balances like this uh, in Russia? Have a look. Two young guys, Andre and Alexander. Andre uh, threatens uh, unemployment coming. Alexander saying, no problem people will simply engage in other types of activity. People dreamt all their lives to work less and deal with their personal things more. And there were stages in this evolution, like uh, new technologies would appear, uh, people would uh, first be resistant, especially people in the profession where uh, which would be replaced by machines. And this is happening, that kept happening throughout the life of humanity. Like uh, people say that robots are coming and people will get unemployed without anything to do. But smart people have made their calculations until year 2030. What is going to happen and how? So these people tell us, we will not even notice the penetration of robots in our lives. And there's this notion of a smart house. This is all robots inside the home. You press a button, and the robot would make something for you. A robot does not need to be a lookalike of a human being. It's the technology that is behind uh, services, and we cannot do without such things. So I don't think that it's going to be a revolution, rather an evolution, and new specialties would appear. By 2030 again, 2, 3, 5 percent more smart systems would appear. There are many systems that work already, but maybe they don't, their um, performance is not as good as we would want. And this is happening gradually. The most robotized country in the world is Germany. Take a look at uh, Mercedes plants and other automotive, automotive makers. Uh, and it's really scary. You see a lot of uh, robots and uh, mechanisms, but there are no people around. Uh, when you go on tour there, you get a little bit, uh, gets creepy. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's just amazing how they do, this all works. You're just afraid that they would put something on, on top of your head. But there, the unemployment rate is not growing. It uh, has stabilized. And uh, Spain is the uh, least uh, robotized country. In Europe and there, unemployment rate is soaring. So there is no correlation there. So it seems that it may be a uh, situation of conflict, but it may not be so. And the farther we go, um, the more humans will be uh, 
finding solutions. Of course, this is a heated debate. Um, and uh, this is something that has uh, been designed by the organizers. Don't be scared by this, but Karen asked a very good question. We could go through a list of those scares, but we don't uh, need to. It would be just uh, too ridiculous to do this. I mean, uh, people are complaining these days that children are not reading. We are getting this uh, backwards and so on. But experts calculated, and uh, it turned out that uh, what today's kids uh, are doing, they're writing more than people of my age when they were kids were writing, when they just, you know, press those buttons on their smartphones and gadgets. So these development trends uh, that we see now, the development of the Internet, of various platforms and systems, is something that is precipitating uh, shifts, uh, social shifts. And now we're talking about digital socialism, because there are a lot of services that are available where, which people share, they use jointly. And uh, uh, so essentially everyone contributes uh, what they can, and then they get uh, what they need uh, in return. So a lot of services are getting essentially free. You don't have to have anything cumbersome um, on, on your body uh, in order to be able to use a service. I mean, we're basically using small devices in order to get a lot of free services. People are creating a lot of things jointly, and everything that is created, uh, thus created, becomes everyone's uh, essentially property. We use it all. And essentially, um, that's how things things are evolving. And I, mean, I could go on and on about this. It's an interesting point you've just raised. From the standpoint of economics, every two, three, five years, we conduct studies. Uh, we study the economics of the Russian internet. And the farther we go, the more difficult it is uh, uh, getting for us to find out uh, paid services. A lot of services are free to use, and essentially they're not creating an, a contribution to the GDP, at least on the surface of it. And uh, you see a tremendous increase in productivity, uh, which is also a contributing factor. You save a lot of time. And uh, this is something that one needs to take into account when making uh, their economic calculations. So new approaches are needed. And another good example is the smart house. Uh, we need to think about this uh, in parallel with uh, how electricity was evolving 100 years ago. Uh, uh, and I understand there is a, a film that is uh, going to come out about uh, Edison, Tesla, Westinghouse. 100 years ago, it was not clear which standards are going to be accepted for voltage, AC versus DC. There is sockets for plugs. Some of them were very uh, dangerous to use, unsafe to use. Um, some of them would be incendiary. They would, uh, you know, burn your house down. And we had to go through those current wars in order to come to a common understanding or to a common platform, to common uh, principles of safety, among other things. So right now, we live in a very interesting age. A lot of these things are not settled. And you guys are the ones that are going to be handling this and dealing with that later on. And Andre, I'd like to ask you, Uh, to the best of my knowledge, you have some projects uh, that uh, you, you use in order to support young programmers, young people. And uh, can you say a few words about such platform streams? Let me uh, ask a question to my colleague. Well, what I was talking about when I was talking about philosophy, um, I was trying to say that games is the equivalent of uh, work. Well, that's really an excuse he's devised. But Mr. Nikiforov yesterday uh, spoke about the introduction of the crypto ruble. That really unties our hands. Well, the uh, essence of the free-to-play games is that most people play these games free of charge. They do not pay anything. But there are some people that can pay a certain amount of money for something that they like, for some content the appearance, the emergence of uh, uh, cryptocurrencies, the emergence of uh, 
a blockchain is something that solves two critical problems. Uh, this addresses the problem of fraud. I have a uh, very cool sword. I want to exchange it with you. And uh, uh, you uh, need a contract that would allow you to uh, make an exchange without uh, the fear of fraud. And secondly, I may have a lot of free time. I have a lot of uh, time I spend it playing. And then I want to make an exchange with someone so that someone pays me for what I can offer. And so crypto currencies allow me to make this payment, this transfer, fairly painlessly. So when we speak about traditional currencies, that's a little bit more difficult to pull off. One person is in Indonesia, another one in the United States, the third one is in Europe. How can you have a marriage of all these things? But with blockchain and cryptocurrencies, this becomes possible. If people decide, for whatever reason, to change a game into their work. They can play the game eight hours a day, and they can get paid for playing the game. I'm not even talking about cyber sports. And I saw Alexander Pavlichenko, and I remembered about this. Cyber sport is a separate subject. Uh, similar to a regular sport, people would uh, practice, would train, uh, they would uh, pay, uh, get paid certain salaries, They participate in competitions and tournaments, and they that's how they make them living. So in many respects, games are work, and the appearance of uh, blockchain-based technologies is something that allows us to make this migration possible. Speaking about the support that we, uh, we uh, provide for new technologies and new technology-based companies. I'd like to say that games is very technology-intensive software. Um, there are very few technologies that we didn't try in our games. Uh, for example, uh, cloud gaming. As you probably know, about 10, 15 years ago, one of the key problems of uh, games or the de of the development of gaming in Russia was piracy. You could go to uh, essentially uh, any any location, any under underpass, and you would buy a CD-ROM with the games. But now you can uh, use the cloud service, and uh, uh, the the game will be in the clouds, and you would only be essentially using the interface without having the actual game on your computer, you just push the buttons. That gives a lot of work to the companies that create such clouds and to the uh, game makers. Crowdsourcing was also mentioned. Crowdsourcing is the trend that uh, is on the downward curve uh, in terms of hype, but that's a great thing because it is only thanks to crowdfunding and crowdsourcing that young, talented people that really are eager to develop games that they can raise the initial capital they need in order to build their game and then place them on Steam or on Greenline platforms. Now they can do it. That's uh, all I had to say about the support. Uh, Karen, uh, I'm really bursting with, with uh, wanting to ask you. I mean, we're trying to go away from this main subject. I didn't know that we were flying together with Andre. I had heard the name, but I hadn't met him. We were flying next to each other. I wouldn't say what we were actually drinking while we were flying, but it was a good experience. Um, I, you know, I'm kind of a, a feeling that I need to move uh, somewhere away from him because I, um, I'm speaking about the beauty of work, and he's talking about the beauty of uh, games. I see a lot of young people here, and we need to think about how to uh, use the free time we have. But in addition to playing games, we need to produce something so that Andre could create such things, because you've just created a game. This is intangible. You need to have the hardware that will allow your game to uh, function. A friend of mine, Mikhail Kovalchuk, likes to tell this joke. He's the director of the Kurchatov Institute of Moscow. He says, OK, Google says, I own the world. I press the button, and I get any information that I need. Well, but the net would say, if it weren't uh, for my networks, I mean, you could push buttons 
um, you wouldn't be getting in it. But electricity said, oh, come on, guys, what about me? Uh, I really wanted to uh, uh, enroll into the Bauman University, but the, I had to uh, settle for the Moscow State University. Not, not too bad. I was uh, learning to become an economist, but which is uh, not something that will hold against you. Uh, speaking about the intersection of games and the world, uh, there's a good example, a very interesting example. There is uh, Yanis Yurifakis, the ex-Minister uh, of Finance of Greece, a leftist. Uh, for a long time, he's been studying game-based economies, how uh, free-to-play uh, works, how those internal systems operate. And that was a very unique study that uh, he made. It's very unique for the economies of the future. Maybe it's premature now, but uh, since we are talking about uh, some form of uh, income that would, would you would be entitled to no matter what. And so maybe there is a place for cryptocurrencies there. And those, those are going to be cryptocurrencies that are going to be very different from uh, Bitcoin or others. Uh, all of this information uh, that was published by this uh, economist is all uh, publicly available. You can find this on the net. So this is probably one of the areas where things will be going. So about two or three years ago, we set up an internet forum in uh, in Dagestan, in Mahkachkal, I was surprised to see how many young people there are that are interested in these technologies. They see these technologies as probably one of the only possible ways to uh, grow personally, professionally. And I know that in addition to the venture funds, there are some projects underway, uh, projects that are being implemented by young companies. and. And uh, there's support provided to young individuals and young developers and engineers and scientists. Can you say a few words about this? Well, we're talking about uh, the support for the entrepreneurship uh, initiatives of young people. Uh, within our group, we have uh, support for such initiatives uh, by young entrepreneurs. And uh, uh, although we are a large conglomerate, we are a large investment and industrial group inside we are very much in favor of encouraging entrepreneurship. We uh, work with a lot of different uh, projects that are brought to us but by our own staff, by people that come from outside of our company. We try to be tuned in, especially now, given that there are a lot of young people in Russia, talented young people that can create, capable of creating uh, interesting projects, uh, generating new ideas. And that is why we're paying a lot of uh, attention, increasingly a lot of attention, to those regions where we are present. We have uh, projects that we implement in the Far East, in the central part of Russia. And just four years ago, um, we decided to uh, uh, put forward uh, a project with business incubators, something that uh, Silicon Valley had been uh, known for. We decided to open such a business incubator in Makhachkala, in the, the Republic of Dagestan, the south of Russia. And uh, many people didn't believe in the success. That, that was the time when uh, banking cards were not really uh, that uh, popular. You couldn't uh, pay uh, for your food in most uh, uh, grocery stores, and there were not a lot of good bookstores available, but nevertheless, we were quite successful with that endeavor. And I'm quite uh, happy to say that this is still one of the centers of gravity for the young, talented individuals. A lot of projects have been implemented through that center. A lot of young people were able to see um, there a social lift, um, and many of them are now working successfully in Moscow and Israel. Some of them are doing internships in the United States with a promise to come back, and I'm confident that they will come back. So to us, uh, supporting young teams is uh, um, a priority for our group because uh, 
transportation and logistics are the focus of what we do, container shipments, uh, new types of and modes of transportation. And therefore, I would like to announce that we're going to have a startup challenge competition uh, next year for uh, Russian teams and foreign teams. Uh, these are going to be the teams that are developing technologies for transportation and logistics. We are going to announce uh, this startup challenge later on additionally, but I'm sure some of you that are present here uh, include people that have certain ideas that could be implemented in this field. We would like to select the best projects, and they are going to be the ones that will get our support and allow us to raise money for such startup projects. What is more important, we're going to be able to provide our uh, resources, our companies that uh, uh, work on the global scene, uh, so that you could implement those projects. So we would be happy to see you at our Startup Challenge event next year. Wonderful. Uh, not to uh, drag our feet with this, I would like to uh, talk to the audience here. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. Wonderful. I see some uh, uh, hands raised, one or two, and hopefully uh, there will be volunteers with microphones. Andrei Lebedev, Center of Prototyping from the Nizh Novgorodska Oblast. A very simple question. You mentioned the fact that in future a lot of people will be playing a lot, so work less. So, so you liked it, really, that there will be less work. No, I didn't like it. Uh, together with a friend of mine, we are discussing this. Uh, uh, and um, he came to Germany. He went to Germany. And uh, it's easier for him when he doesn't have anything. But uh, here, I have employment, and I have certain uh, promise in terms of my, uh, my future. And so we're discussing. Uh, this issue of uh, income that will come your way no matter what, something that would be assured or guaranteed income for you. This is the question I have. So I think the uh, Swiss decided not to experiment, and the Finns are going to be the first ones to experiment this with this. Well, I have uh, very good feelings about this uh, guaranteed income thing. Uh, it's not because it's socialism or it's good for everyone. Different countries deal with this differently. For example, the Swiss wanted to uh, slow down the influx of um, refugees. Uh, and uh, it's easy to do. You just uh, raise the prices. And uh, um, the migrants would not be able to afford anything. The, the Finns are a little bit more wise about this. And um, this is still an experiment in many uh, uh, nations. Uh, and uh, in, in the United States, they had some very controversial sort of preliminary results. But again, if I start uh, answering further, I would say that uh, by advertising games, because games can provide you with this uh, guaranteed income. You don't have to take uh, a particular game. I mean, any game can be uh, looked at as a as a as an employment, something that you do for a living. And within games, you can get paid for what you do because you get redistribution of uh, cash flows. Uh, there are people that pay a lot. There are people that don't, don't pay a lot. And you can model those streams. And there are people that uh, are partially responsible for the growth of this economy. So uh, you can use the same approach uh, in assuring that this um, guaranteed income exists. So there can be several models, but I uh, try to answer this. Actually, we're working a lot. It may uh, sound strange, but uh, say um, in the 30s of the previous century, if you compare how, many, how much we worked back then and now, we're much more productive. And with this surge in productivity, supposedly we should be working less. But we're still working quite a lot. 
Tanyakika from Sochi. Now my question is to all speakers. What are the IT technologies that are going to influence the future of society? How is that going to affect the economy? How is that going to transform society? Bitcoin, for example, maybe social relations would change. What do you think about all of these things? Alexander, you started it all, so you have to ask. Is it IT technologies only or new technology in, in general you're interested in? How is that going to transform life? Well, well, A, young people are thinking new technology. And uh, te new technologies are very closely uh, linked to uh, information. And you need to go deeper into the matter to divide, be uh, distinguish between the two. Well, our fundamental belief is that technologies will, A, give more spare time to people, which they would pr probably speak, uh, use uh, for creative endeavor, and second, B, such technologies as artificial intelligence would improve the efficiency, would result in savings on a global scale. And third, that would result, as I said before, to the economy of individual consumption. And IT technologies, any information navigators in the world of huge amounts of content would be needed, absolutely. You need super professional navigators who would help you find the right content out of the huge amount of games, etc., etc., would form your individual consumption pattern. In that respect, probably I would ask a question from the director of Bauman University. What do you think? Which technologies are going to change the format of education? Because very important change taking place in education. The best universities offer online courses, including uh, Moscow State, Bauman, Stanford, Hartford, Hartford, et cetera, et cetera. People don't have to go to universities. There's no longer a gap. Uh, it's fundamental change. Had I been 18 years old right now, I would think whether to go to offline university or online university. I actually graduated from the Moscow State, not Bauman. I would think whether I should go to new university physically. Do I need to, to spend six years in college? You're absolutely right that some fundamental basic things should be taught at universities. You still need brick and mortar to build the house. You need electricity to charge your phone. There's always going to be a place for fundamental education. And there should be people, of course, who would maintain all those robots, artificial intelligence, intelligence machines, etc. But the question is, again, what is going to happen to education? If Quran allows, yes, let me take this question. But before, well, human aspirations in the development of new technology, improved labor productivity, is to save more time for other more pleasant things that people like. And this is right and natural. That's one side to it. And the second side, and that People want want to spend less material things to manufacture a product. Like before, machine tools were huge, huge uh, things. Uh, now, much, much smaller. Well, right. You need brick and mortar to build the house, but tomorrow we can will be able to print them out in a 3D printer. Uh, but the material part will always be there. And today, in this search, we're seeing the following happening. Well, there are supercomputers 
we know about them. Very huge machines like a soccer field. They consume uh, a, a tremendous amount of energy. They emit so much heat. And our brain is almost uh, as powerful as Lomonosov supercomputer, but consuming very small amounts of electricity. You cannot compare the efficiency between the two. And there are many things uh, to learn to use before we optimize our uh, labor inputs. But still, the material things will stay. Even the best game from Andre would uh, not be accessible by us unless there is electricity. So our guys, some present here, they will show a lot of what we're doing right now. It's new materials and like composite materials. Before entrance here, we have some on display. Uh, like uh, make a sk skateboard or um, I, I, ice hockey stick. That's one thing. But another thing is uh, a device to filter blood without damaging uh, the particles in the blood to cure disease. Uh, many uh, thousands of people die from. It's the guys of your age who manufactured that filter. They're making these filters also to, to uh, filter out onco particles. They're just uh, starting with that to fight cancer. And uh, uh, we have uh, first good results already. We don't want to have cancer, right? So this component should always be uh, there. Now, nanotechnologies. This is not simply the size of particles. Not only that. It's a different level of interaction with nature. 20th century was the century of analysis. Like, we take a big block. Uh, take everything out which is unnecessary, and we have David of Michelangelo. Now what we have, we do it differently. It's synthesis. We take atoms and put those together to build something new. It requires much less energy, much, much less effort, and much less material, and we don't pollute the environment with the same result. So the paradigm, paradigm is changing. And again, material and non-material. Uh, the uh, proportion should change, but we will always uh, have to use uh, m materials. And when new technologies appeared in this educational process, see what's happening. Like no more borders. We argued a lot whether the Bolognese process is good or bad. Now we're no longer about that. No borders. You press three buttons, and you can listen to a lecture from the best uh, professor in the world, a Nobel laureate, etc. But to be able to understand this material, well, you have to use it, right, somehow. You have, but uh, to be able to perceive it in a correct way, you need to train your brain. Like uh, bodybuilders train their muscle, you have to train your brains. Why are guys so smart right now? Because they do mathematics at, at college. Why would they want to, to have mathematics since they're gaming right now? Let mathematics make them smart. You always need fundamental education, like our college. We're in applied science, but without fundamental uh, education, nothing works out in practical ap uh, applied terms. And this is the strong feature of our university. In the past, um, well, the best guys that we had, and we are actually friends with the Moscow State, and I'm glad that you're a graduate of Moscow State. We've been in cooperation for 25 years. We have uh, the same learned council. 
And uh, in the past, we would send our guys to a uh, well, special course in Moscow State. Now we can do that ourselves. So in education, material versus non-material, this one stays. An engineer, a technical person, would not learn unless they feel it with their own hands. Hands-on knowledge is very important. Without those very complex computations, you cannot build the filter I mentioned. Uh, this is the tool they are using. And, in, and on the touch uh, and feel is also very important of all the materials. We need more freedom. We need more uh, choice for younger people so that they structure their educational process themselves. And the learning should go on for life. Uh, clearly, you uh, cannot put on all the information uh, in six years uh, into the guys' heads. I keep on saying that the uh, student is not a vessel to be filled. It's a torch to be lighted. We then uh, teach uh, young guys to know how to learn independently. In this situation, they will always be successful. We have Oh, well, uh, such things like uh, well, nuclear uh, processes, like a telescope that uh, is designed to uh, watch the sun. And it's at 80 kilometers from uh, people uh, uh, where the people are located watching the sun. This can be done remotely. We have stands to study quickly moving objects, uh, like a bombshell, etc. Uh, now they study the process uh, at a distance of 80 kilometers. And our um, other universities do not have this equipment. And we have lots of uh, plasma equipment, nano equipment. We invite guys from other colleges to participate, use uh, the technology that we have available at our university. But still, this connection between the teacher and the student will always be there. It was there in Socrates' times. At the end of the third millennium, it will stay. Because the main base of knowledge is goes from teacher to student. Well, similar technologies would be available in medicine. Uh, uh, doctors and medical technology and surgery probably would be done uh, remotely in the future. Or, or a robot, robots, yeah. But uh, the robot also should uh, uh, learn how to do surgery. Yeah. I have a few words to add. Uh, there's more heat in the audience, I feel. I am for fundamental education. But watching what's happening in the audience right now, from time to time, I see some people who take out their phones, especially when we start talking about spaceship or new technology. I'm telling you this for the because of the following. Well, we started the discussion about what is going to change in uh, people's lives. Huh? So far, we've been talking about positive uh, effects of technology. And kind of we, uh, assume here that all new technologies are useful to people. No, not necessarily so. Some things, like today, 42% of Americans uh, suffer from this disease that uh, they cannot control the time they stay in social media. Yeah, you enter the, the go online uh, thinking it is going to be five minutes, but you stay there for three hours. Right. Well, social media, is it useful technology? Well, on the one hand, yes, uh, helps us communicate, but not necessarily only positive. So, you need to have a balance here. Which of the technologies uh, have what effect on uh, people? 
people actually became uh, humans because uh, social interaction very important for people. Why is social media so uh, popular right now? Because there is feedback, communication, socializing. And we don't have an immunity against that. We need social interaction. We cannot control it. For how long are we going to stay within this social media? Therefore, there's addiction to games, Instagram, Facebook, contact, etc. Well, I, uh, I'm talking these things. To stress this one again, yes, there are new breakthrough technologies helping people, clearly so, like in medicine, but some technologies are not necessarily positive. And there's also a matter of uh, data protection, etc., etc. We know how to do that, right? There was a girl at the end and a young person closer to the stage. Hello, my name is Viktor Miroshnichenko, Head of Development, Software Development and the Data Base in Hakasia University. My friend who is doing cloud um, deployment in Australia saying they are undermining their own business. Microsoft saying they're developing an information system which, without the involvement of a programmer based on user request, would be able to generate the software needed by the user. And they say it's going to be more productive than uh, work done by uh, software developers, less bu bugs, etc., etc. Do you agree with what they state? Uh, and if that Microsoft managed to uh, bring that uh, project to fruition, to completion, would you agree with their statement that uh, uh, such software is going to be better quality software than the one um, created by hu humans? And that would not that mean that the software developers would undermine their own area of business? Play more games. It would be easier for you to lead your life then. No, no. We don't have to scare ourselves. This has been happening all the time. When those search engines were first developed, and that happened only 20 to 30 years ago, Karan may, may give us an accurate date. Like when you were born, first engines appeared. Back then, people would say creating such networks would not, was impossible. That would be worth, worth uh, trillions of dollars, and all, all people on planet Earth should have been involved in that process. But those engines were created, and it was not worth uh, trillions of dollars. And it was. And one third of uh, the population of the planet participated in some way in that process. You know, every time you use a search engine, you help perfect that search engine. What are smart systems right now? There are neural networks, uh, self-learning networks. Uh, as they operate, they learn more. This is something where software developers have a major role. But once those uh, systems, those intellectuals, intellectual safe learning systems, once they achieve a certain stage, software developers may not be that important. This is, again, uh, the balance between material things and non-material things. Material things, in this particular case, is very good software developers. That part is going to shrink, and the immaterial would increase, and our common involvement would increase. But um, uh, highly intellectual uh, software developers would uh, play a role. Don't be afraid about that. You can never stop progress. And whether we want it or not, I mean, we cannot ban the internet or uh, install filters uh, to uh, uh, limit access to the information. Uh, remember, in Hong Kong, uh, there was an issue with uh, handover. Uh, it used to be rented by England, then it went uh, back to 
China, and uh, the internet was limited, and then created uh, the uh, internal network using the mobile um, network, uh, using the cell phones, uh, despite the limitations of the uh, Chinese government. So they were able to overcome that. It took uh, the government two years to get uh, uh, sort of the uh, deciphering thing in place, and then they decided just to open the internet. So there are certain trends that you cannot change, you cannot reverse. Uh, initially, we're afraid of something, and then we believe that there's something that we cannot uh, uh, get rid of this and cannot live without it. But the first thing we need to get rid of would be the testers. Uh, you're right. The programmers are no longer uh, a new, a unique profession, and the more programmers there are, uh, the uh, great is the trend towards the minimization of the number of programmers. So that's uh, what is happening right now. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nadyadov Evgeny. I've come from Smolensk Oblast. Today we're talking about trends at this panel discussion, and as a young scientist, I'm interested in the uh, technological industry 4.0, smart uh, manufacturing, professional production within a large industrial park. So to my question, this 4.0 uh, industrialization uh, concept is uh, evolving in Germany and in uh, the United States. It will come to Russia very soon. So the question I uh, have is what industries uh, are we going to see it in? And it is clear to me that uh, investment uh, would be required in new tools, in new machines, and new technologies. But if we don't do this, we're going to uh, be losing in the future. So. What do, do you think, when and where are we going to see this uh, in the nearest future? First of all, let me say that we're already seeing that. Uh, I, I don't like this uh, uh, term juggling because industry 4.0 is the uh, very specific thing that is happening in Germany. It's the industry development program for Germany. And the uh, reason it just shifted to elsewhere is just the fault of the uh, market experts, marketologists. But I understand where you're coming from. Take any field, transportation, agriculture, uh, manufacturing and industry. In all these industries, these are the things that are being implemented. Some people are ahead of the game. Some are, you know, doing the basics. And uh, there are drones that work uh, within the field. Uh, that's why they install those towers with LoRa, and that's why they're using operatorless uh, means of communications. And there are no single standards, and there's no unified standard for that yet. That's something that we've uh, already mentioned. There is no single picture of what's happening. Alexander, did you want to add something? There's always a temptation to uh, initiate new industrialization. I am in favor of uh, private uh, entrepreneurship and the initiative of private entrepreneurs. And I believe that people, individual people, they sometimes feel what's going on better than uh, the entire state's apparatus would and uh, the entire economy would. So whether we're going to see this in Russia, I know that they're paying increasingly more attention to modernization of uh, manufacturing capacities. Uh, our technoparks are functioning in every region of the country. We have programs to uh, support import uh, displacement and substitu substitution. Oh, well, to what extent this is going to be successful? How can this compare with what's happening in Germany and other parts of the world? I don't know the answer to this question, but if uh, what the government creates as an infrastructure, and if it is filled with the right concept and the right initiative uh, that is uh, pioneered and spearheaded by the people sitting in this room, then we can count on moving to the next level, moving up. I'd like to say that over these 90 minutes, we've been able to go over all of the key uh, terms, blockchain, space technologies, drones, uh, and uh, uh, looms, whether we need to uh, play games, to learn how to play games, there's a realm of questions. 
the uh, spectrum of questions is very broad, and you have a whole week in front of you participating in sessions like this. So I think it is very important and realistically important to uh, be able to talk about certain things that are of interest to you. I mean, you know, people can talk about something for an hour and a half. I mean, so if you have those thoughts, you have to catch those insights that you hear in the sessions like this. It's these insights that are, you know, creating the breakthroughs. And I'm really uh, envious to you. You can uh, participate for one week in the game shops uh, and workshops. and. Uh, but please be attentive uh, and be tuned in uh, because you're going to be able to hear these great ideas. You can just listen, but uh, you could also listen attentively and actively and uh, catch things that are of importance to you. I would also like to add to what has been said by Alexander. Just uh, uh, carpe diem, as they would say, seize the day. As young uh, scientists, uh, you would be trying to implement your inventions. Uh, you would be uh, targeting those inventions at some key audience. Uh, just a, an idea I would like to share with you. We have been discussing with my colleagues this thing. As we grow longer, we have now a whole uh, group of people, a class of people that are underserved. People uh, from 50 to 75, they are mature people, but not, they're not really old yet. So it is for these people uh, that we don't have a lot of things. We don't have uh, the uh, research support for how to do uh, exercises uh, to maintain their health in, in good condition, how to uh, arrange their nutrition properly. Well, they have the money, but uh, they want to uh, eat healthily. They want to eat organic food. Uh, are you going to be able to uh, give them the right structure to follow? So we're not talking about technologies for the sake of technologies, inventions for the sake of uh, inventions. And now that we, with the uh, increase of life ex expectancy, we have this large group of people um, who don't have anything, uh, you know, from the... Uh, technology world, uh, something that is related to their well-being, with uh, their health, uh, something that would be good for your mother-in-law, for example. And so that's the idea I'd like to share with you. Yes. Hello. My name is Evgeny Karol. I represent the delegation of Latvia. I have a question for each of the uh, members of the panel. So I'll start. Well, that's a really substantive approach. I will start with uh, Anatoly Alexandrov. And I have two uh, things. Uh, it deals with crowdfunding. You said that the uh, uh, trend is in a downward curve. I'm interested where this trend is going down. And where do you get this information regarding crowdfunding? that it is on the decline now. That's probably the question to me, because I was the one talking about this. So when we started the session today, we uh, uh, mentioned this hype loop of uh, Gartner. Uh, well, we are talking about the uh, decline of the hype. And uh, I'm just looking at my own experience. I'm looking at the, at the hype or with crowdsourcing and crowdfunding. That was really at the summit in 2014, 2015. There was the word. Now the hype is with the word ICO, initial a coin offering. And now I have this game. I want to issue coins for my game. You just uh, get uh, the money to me. <coughs> but the classical crowdfunding was at its peak when uh, Valve, at its Steam platform, created a green light program. There were many platforms like that. You could uh, place a uh, video about the game you're making, and then you would collect the money for that. You would raise the money. But over the last five years, there are a lot of things happening, a lot of m as mergers and acquisitions. Large players are eating up small players. 
So you would pitch a game company, you would ga get some starting sitting money, and uh, you select what's closer to you. You, 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 you know your own ways of uh, uh, raising funds. I don't see a lot of uh, new crowdfunding platforms emerging over the last three years. All large ones uh, are the ones that emerged five years ago, and they still exist. And the largest amount of money for um, games was about 100,000 uh, that was raised in 2015. Well, one more question, because we are really pressed for time. Well, since you were talking about automation, you are saying that automation is not really developing in Latvia. We don't have uh, huge projects, but we have a very good uh, uh, programming base. Uh, and you know the company called Accenture in Latvia? They are selecting a team to uh, automate um, various uh, fields. They have over 100 programmers, and they are now selecting <coughs> experts to build this in a beautiful way. So what's the question? The, it's not a question, really. I wanted to, uh, sorry, I wrote this down. Uh, um, Anatoly Alexander spoke about uh, Germany, uh, compared Germany and Spain in terms of uh, resources. You mentioned that they have automation and uh, robotization growing, and the unemployment rate stays the same. But in in Germany, they invest a lot in education. And in Spain, even if you introduce automation and robotization, and if you don't invest as much as Germany does in, uh, well, if you do invest uh, in, in education as Germany does, you will see such um, growth in employment. Um, that has uh, been known for some time. It's not just uh, uh, today's news. At the beginning of the crisis in Europe, the very first phase, uh, it was indicative of how people would uh, would act. Some people would just uh, be more frugal with their expenses. Some people would uh, not buy additional games and would not spend a lot of money now. And that is not as expensive as it used to be. But what did the uh, Dutch do? In the, uh, in the northern provinces, they saw some changes in consumption. They became critical, and uh, therefore they required subsidies. And so the government didn't know how to support that. So what they did, they built a university in one of the largest cities. And now it has 60,000 students in that university in small uh, Holland. And uh, as a result, uh, from being subsidized, it became self-sufficient, that, that area did. And uh, that is something that has been going on for like the last 20 years. So education is key. And if you invest in education, if you're the state or if you are uh, investing in your own education, that's very important. That's critical for everyone, for the state or for the individuals. Because if you're well educated, and even if it's really hard as you're getting your education, that's a guarantee that you're going to be <coughs> successful and free people. Uh, Paul Graham, a very well-known uh, uh, venture investor, he said that if you want to create in your own country a Silicon Valley, start by creating a world-class university. That's it. Uh, time is up. Uh, unfortunately, I would like to thank you all. Thank the participant and thanks uh, to the audience for your questions. I'm sorry I couldn't give the floor to all of you. Thanks to the organizers. And uh, the next session will be focusing on, yes. We'll talk about technologies again. Thank you uh, to the speakers. Uh, may I have your attention for one second. In about 30 minutes, we will continue talking about the technologies of the future. We are looking forward to seeing you in this room. We'll be discussing digital transformations. And later on, on the <coughs> screen, we will see the link to the Telegram channel of this session. Uh, we will have their presentations of the speakers. We'll be looking forward to your questions and to your presence. Thank you, and enjoy your break.